as well as aspects of Western culture too. Now, being a Christian is somehow perceived to mean giving up much of one's own culture and uh, adopting Western culture instead. Now, today's talk is about addressing these three points. So it is perfectly understandable if you ask, can I be a Christian and stay faithful to my own culture? Okay? Right, uh, let's answer the first reason f uh, uh, very quickly. It is historically true that um, um, the Christian faith has been practiced in Europe for a long, long time. But the percentage of practicing and self-professed uh, self um, uh, Christians is actually on a decline. Now, massive population growth in the last 150 years. There are now more Christians in the global south than in the global north. Five of the largest churches in the world are in South Korea, India, and the Philippines. In the UK, although the percentage of people calling themselves Christians when they fill in the, uh, the census form, it used to be 80 to 90% in the 1950s, just after you know, World War II. In the latest 2021 census, only about 45% of people called themselves Christians across England and Wales. Now, that percentage, um, in how much of that percentage is actually you know, real practicing Christians and how many are just you know, nominal Christians who only go to church like uh, you know, on uh, um, you know, Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve, for example. But the actual percentage of uh, practicing Christians in the 50s and even now, the actual percentage is around 7 to 8%. So that, that hasn't changed. So the actual decline in number is really to do with people who say themselves, who call themselves Christian, uh, in, you know, in whether nominally or not. Now I will say a bit more about uh, Christianity and Western culture when I answer uh, reason three. Okay. Now the second reason I gave. In the 18th and the 19th century, missionaries came to Africa, to Latin America, to Asia, with, alongside with uh, um, colonialism. And Christianity was being perceived to be a part of colonialism from the West. But let's get one thing very clear. Christianity did not originate in the West. Now, where Jesus was born, he was born in Palestine. Okay, Now that feels Eastern to people from the West. And where Jesus was born, Palestine, feels Western to people from the East. Now the, the gospel originated in Palestine, was spread by his disciples from Judea through Samaria to the ends of the earth. It is significant that Jesus Christ was born not in Europe, but at crossroads between three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Now, Palestine is called the Near East, if you're European. And to say that Christianity is actually a Western religion is geographically and culturally not correct. And the fact of the matter is this, to be a Christian is to be counter-cultural. That means against the, the normal uh, in any culture. And to follow Jesus Christ as a disciple is to be counter-cultural in whatever culture that you come from or living in now. It doesn't matter whether you're in England or in India or in Hong Kong, which is my place of birth. Okay. Why is it be, why, why is being a Christian countercultural in England? 
Now, the UK is probably the most pluralistic and multicultural nation in, in the world. This may be you know, less so in rural areas, but certainly in big cities like London or Birmingham, that is very true. Now, these days, by not trying to offend, some companies have set up rules about not wearing any religious items when you go to work. There was a, a famous case of a British Airways check-in um, worker. Um, she was showing a cross on her necklace and she was being told that was against company uniform policy. She complained and it went all the way to the highest court of the land and it was the European Court of Human Rights that ruled it to be unlawful and it infringed her right to express her faith. And these days, religion is being pushed into a private domain. You can be a Christian, no problem, as long as you don't try to influence others in public areas. If you are a doctor or a nurse, you shouldn't offer to pray for your patients because you are asserting your influence on someone who is vulnerable health-wise. If you are a politician, you certainly cannot say you hear God's voice telling you about this and that idea and advocating you know, a certain policy. Even at the workplace, I'll share something with you. A few years ago, I was working um, for a major utility company and uh, I got to know this guy fairly well. Um, and uh, you know, we got on quite well socially we would go to lunch sometimes, and we would go to the gym. Now, this guy practices MMA, he makes martial arts. Oh, have I not told you, I've got, I've got another hobby. Um, I've spent the last 40 years trying to perfect a style of Chinese martial art in my life, and I'm still aiming for it. And that is called Southern Praying Mantis, all right? Have you all watched, have you all watched the Kung Fu Panda? Come on, you must have, yeah? You know, you've got the uh, dragon warrior, Po. Yeah, and what are his friends? Tigress, the crane, the snake, the monkey, and then the green little guy, the praying mantis. Well, I've spent 40 years trying to perfect that in my life. Okay, I'm still not quite there yet. Uh, but I practice the southern praying mantis because the northern one looks like this. But the southern one, I hold my fist like that using the phoenix eye. So I hit with the point of my finger. Yeah, and we do it with power and speed. But anyway, so this guy who practices MMA, we train together, like, you know, he punching pads and so on in the gym. So we got on quite fairly well. Then, uh, you know, one day we went for lunch and I said, well, you know, why don't we get together uh, maybe once or twice every month just to talk about life, you know, men's issues and so on. And he said, well, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. All right, there was a Friday. Then comes the Monday morning after the weekend. I started work early. And then I felt that he came all the way from where he was sitting right next to me. And he said, I know what you're up to. You're trying to make me a believer, aren't you? and I react very badly to people like you. And he stormed off. We've never spoken again. So to be a Christian, to want to share the gospel, can be counter-cultural. Because people think that, you know, if you're a Christian, you're fine. But put, leave it in your own, own space, yeah? Right, so now why is it counter-cultural in Hong Kong? Well. Hong Kong was, a, was previously a, a British colony. Uh, I can't see. Anyone from Hong Kong here? <laughs> okay. Anyone been to Hong Kong? A couple. Me too. Okay. Now, Hong Kong was previously a British colony that was returned to China in 1997. Hong Kong is a very modern uh, and is predominantly uh, Cantonese speaking with English being spoken, you know, widely or at least understood uh, uh, to a very extent. 
Now, some people think that by becoming Christian, you are embracing Western culture and its Western religion like Christianity over the culture you are born in. They call you a um, banana. Know what that means? Banana is yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Do you get it? Yeah. The reverse is, you know, an egg. You're white on the inside, on the outside, and yellow on the inside. They call you a banana. Now, and Christians, they don't observe some of the Chinese rituals, such as offering incense and sacrifice to ancestors, because ancestor worship is quite commonly practiced amongst Chinese people. And by not doing so, their parents and relatives think that you are disrespecting our ancestors. So that is a real problem faced by returnees who became Christians in the UK. Right. I missed that slide there. Next slide. Well, um, why is it ca counter uh, cultural in Muslim countries? We heard from Greg a couple of nights ago about his friend Abu, remember? Um, and you know, Abu was a Muslim convert to Christianity because he had heard the voice of Jesus Christ in a mosque, I think. Now, he was deemed by other you know, Muslim people to have committed apostasy. Apostasy means you betray your own faith, and it's a big deal. And someone, I think, uh, shot him. But, you know, thank God that the bullet merely glanced off his body and didn't actually, he didn't actually die. So Abu didn't just wear a cross as an adornment, but carry his own cross as the cost of following Jesus Christ. So we go back to the very uh, original question. Is being a Christian... necessarily mean that you have to give up some of your, your culture. Or if I put it another way, being a Christian, is it versus being faithful to my culture, what is it? Now, I would say this is a false choice because becoming a Christian isn't about giving up your own culture. In fact, it's the complete opposite. It is about being incarnate in your own cultural community and being a, a witness of Jesus Christ in your community. Now, my mother tongue is Cantonese, and um, my parents brought me and my siblings here in 1972, so I've been here for a long time. Now, it, 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 it used to bother me that I've got this Hong Kong accent in my English, and I still have. Okay, it used to really bother me. Anyone here uh, are from the home counties like, um, um, I almost say Essex, but Kent or Surrey? Yeah, ooh, well done, yeah. Sussex. Yeah. Can I say that again? Can you put your hands up again? Right. Uh, can you go in the green shirt? Can you say something? <laughs> a, a bit, say, I, I can't, I, uh, say a couple of lines. How are you? That's right. Now, I wanted to speak like him, right, with the accent. But I just can't get rid of my Hong Kong accent. Okay? Now, when I was a teenager, I had, some kind of, I, I, I had a slight speech in, impediment, and I overcame that. But I just can't get rid of my Hong Kong accent. That used to bother me because I would stand out, you know, in like a meeting or in a, or in a class. But then, amazingly, you know, after all these years, okay, after all these years, um, because, you know, or as, you know, because of how my life has, has, has panned out, my involvement has been with a, a, a Chinese church, and the people I serve are mainly uh, Chinese people who speak Cantonese, like from Hong Kong, for example. And because I've been here for a long time, I can also minister to English-speaking people. So despite the fact that you know, I still carry a, a Hong Kong accent, it doesn't really matter because what has panned out is that I can serve both communities. 
And that's why I'm here today speaking to you, all of you, you know, you guys here, uh, you know, the Warwick and see you. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So be proud of who you are, what you are. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you're going to give up your culture and take up Western culture. God uses you as who you are. You know, we cannot um, shake off the, the cultural influence of your upbringing. I cannot shake off the accent I've got because uh, I was born in Hong Kong. And God will equip you much more as you serve him. And I can personally witness to that. Look at Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh, which I alluded several times in the past uh, you know, uh, few days. The incarnation of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, into the world, and specifically into Israel, into Palestine, as a Jew, demonstrates the importance of culture and cultural identity. He lived, he taught, he performed wonders in the name of God, as a Jew to his Jewish community. Now, how Jesus lived his life and his kingdom of God values were definitely counter-cultural. The authorities hated him. And as we know, they conspired against Jesus and betrayed him to the Romans who had Jesus executed on the cross. So being a Christian disciple is to be incarnational into human culture. You are to go back into your home, into your circle of friends, your workplace, your, eth your ethnic community to be a, a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, to, and that could be in England, in India, in Malaysia, in Hong Kong. You are not to reject your own culture, but your values as a disciple of Jesus Christ will be countercultural because you take on the values of the kingdom of God. Let me share the uh, beatitude with you. This is um, the sayings of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. My favorite three are the ones highlighted in yellow. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I, and I will say this, by being a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must consider carefully the cost of your discipleship, knowing full well that your faith, wherever you will be, wherever you are now, is countercultural. I mean, this tent in this mission week at Warwick, you know, we're not here, this, the Christian Union are not here to deceive you, to coerce you, to force you to become a Christian by, promise you, by promising you only long life, blessings and prosperity. No. If the CEO is doing that to you, then they're not really being faithful to the gospel witness. We Christians should be honest up front with our seeker friends. 
and not to get them in order to bump up our statistics of converts to Christianity. How do we win people to Christ? Jesus says this in um, John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 34, 35. And this is very, very, very important. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, my church uh, is located in Hammersmith, okay? Um, and we are quite near Imperial College in London. So our students, they mostly come from Imperial College. And because of my uh, congregation, uh, we, you know, we, 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 um, we, we connect with the, um, a lot of the Cantonese-speaking uh, students from Imperial College. Now, of all the converts we've had over the last five or ten years, nine out of ten of them come to Christ not because of some intellectual breakthrough or some theological you know, revelation. No. Nine out of ten came to Christ because they felt the love of of our Christian brothers and sisters who witness to them. You know, if you're an, an overseas student, you know, you're not with your family. Um, you know, the, the weather here is lousy in, uh, in, in autumn. You know, when they arrive in, say, you know, mid-September, okay, it's overcast, cloudy, they feel suicidal, because in Hong Kong it's not like that, okay? And as we get, get in touch with them, Okay, they feel the love of the brothers and sisters from our, from our church. And in time, they integrate into our church and they become Christians. So, we get to know our, our seekers, not by using some clever arguments or, uh, or, or by coercion, you know, force them into the faith. No, you, you, you show your love as a people, okay, from the Christian union. Because by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one another. Now, yesterday, I shared also Romans 8. Because being a Christian, whether you're in England, or in India, in Hong Kong, wherever you are, is going to be countercultural. Okay? And you must clearly understand the cost of discipleship. It will be harder for you if you come from uh, various countries, probably in the Middle East. But you have to clearly understand the cost to you as a disciple of Christ. And um, let's look again at what Paul writes in Romans 8. I mean, Paul in Romans 8 makes some incredible claims about the implications of um, the works of Jesus and the security we have before God. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. Nothing can separate us from God's love. If God is for us, who can be against us? And in the middle of that chapter, we see Paul talking about our present struggles and suffering, and he encourages his readers to look to God in this waiting season. And he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We have to so bear that in mind. It doesn't matter whether you're in England or in Hong Kong or in India or in the Middle East. In this life, as a Christian, you will suffer unless you don't go out, you don't tell anyone that you're a Christian, whether in the workplace, um, whether uh, within, you know, with your relatives, your friends, you may be rejected because you are a Christian. Consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory, the immense glory that will be revealed in us on that day. So do bear that in mind. And lastly, just a few final words before I end. 
being here has been a great privilege for me, as, as I mentioned to you that uh, this is my second mission week. My first one was 45 years ago, uh, mission week in Durham as an undergraduate. And I, I became a Christian a few months after that. So in a way, I'm like repaying my debt of gratitude by coming to, uh, to you guys uh, on the invite of the Christian Union. Now, to the Christian students amongst you, okay, I mean, you are the future of our churches in this land. My generation is moving on. So um, I want to say sorry that me and your parents have used up so much of the fossil fuels in the land <laughs> and played our part in global warming. You know, the world facing you in the future is going to be more uncertain and life will be tougher for your generation and the ones to follow. And I will say that, you know, work hard for your degrees and, uh, um, and study well. You know, faith and works come hand in hand. There was a bunch of uh, uh, female students in Durham at the time in this Christian union. They, they, they thought that by just being faithful to the Lord, by coming together to pray, to sing songs, and to have to prepare for exams. They went into the exams and they all failed. So faith and works come together. And it was great to hear live music, uh, you know, from talented musicians among you. And I was really impressed by Wednesday night. My goodness, I didn't expect to hear music from my generation you know, rocking all over the world by status quo and the rapper's delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. You know, I wasn't expecting that. I really enjoyed it when I was sitting over there. Now, to the seekers among you, thank you for coming to this event, such as um, the International uh, Afternoon Cafe. I pray one day you will find God. And Jesus Christ is the key. Jesus Christ, who became, who was Word, He became flesh. All that we need to know about God is revealed through Jesus Christ. I pray you will find God one day, the true God. And I'll leave you with the following from the Beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for that. That was very encouraging. Do we have time for questions? Yes, so in a moment, we are going to have a time of Q&A with Kin. So there should be a QR code. There we go. Uh, to log on to Slido, you can ask questions that you may have. This is a perfect opportunity to get those answered. So you can ask those anonymously, but remember, those are going to appear on the Slido um, for everyone to see. And we'll be back in a few minutes. So do chat. Do you have a think about those questions? <laughs> 